Hi everyone, I'm Marie and we are coming to you live from Living Felt because it's Happy Wooly Wednesday! Oh, and thank you so much for joining us here today. I am Marie, we are Living Felt based in Central Texas, and today we're gonna cover the topic of wool and other fibers that you might look at for your felting adventures. We're gonna dig into some deliciousness and I'm gonna cover some of the fibers that we shared in the picture for today's show. We'll talk about whether how these might look wet felted and how they might look needle felted and we're going to do our very best to answer your questions all that's happening over there in the live chat so join in the live chat comment down below because you are entered to win prizes whether you're in the live or you're watching the replay and if you stumbled upon this feed thank you so much for being here if you're interested to learn a little more about wet felting and needle felting today we're specifically going to talk about the different fibers we use for our craft so it's meant to be interactive and we look forward to hearing from you I want to say hi to a few people that have joined us. Hi to Judy Allen in South Carolina and Meredith in Florida. So nice to have y'all here. Charlene's in Wisconsin and Amy Roberts is in Virginia. Thank y'all for joining us. I hope that you'll post your questions. We've seen a lot of good ones come through already. Hi to some friends in Canada, Jan, Marilyn, and Judy. Thank you so much. Um, Gloria Sloan is uh, Sloan Castellanos is all the way in El Salvador. Man, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And to everyone across the pond, I know some of y'all, it's tomorrow already <laughs> for us. So thank you for being here. Um, I want to let you know that we do give away prizes in the live chat and the playback comments like I mentioned. So I'm gonna give away a couple of prizes right now to kick things off. Congratulations to Don Whitman and Louise Schreiber from the last show. You win either our Big Wow bundle of our brand new uh, Wow needle felting pads um, or a felting needle assortment, whichever you choose. So the fairies will be reaching out to you. And speaking of the fairies, the most magical of fairies in all the fiber kingdom are lined up here to share with you just a couple of peeks at some fibers that you might consider and then I promise we're going to dig into a ton more with a bunch of felt examples in today's show. So please welcome the lovely fairy Angela. Yay! Hi y'all. Um, so if you're wanting to add some texture uh, to your project, whether it's wet felting or needle felting, we would recommend that you specifically look for our luster and luxury fibers. And these are an example of some of those. So this is Sari Silk Waste. Uh, these are silk hankies. These are wool locks and wool nips, and Marie is going to show you examples of how to use all of these fibers in both wet felting and needle felting today. And up next we have the lovely fairy Alyssa. Woo Hi, today I'm gonna to show you some fibers that are gonna add some sheen and some shine to your project. So here I have Tussa Silk, Viscose Top, and Bamboo Top. This bamboo top is going to be variegated because it's hand dyed in small batches. These two are going to be commercially dyed so the colors are very consistent. All of these technically cannot felt, but once you add a little bit of wool on top, it'll help um, incorporate that into your project. And Marie is going to show you guys some projects where these are used needle felted and wet felted. And you can find these under the effect fiber tab of our website. Up next is Fairy Trish. Woo -woo! Woo -woo! Hey y'all, today we're excited to introduce our new Maori fiber to you. It comes in over 40 beautiful colors. Got some of the bright tones depicted here. We have beautiful earth tones available as well. It's 27 micron, great for needle felting and wet felting, and Marie will be sharing more. So I'll turn things back over to her to get the party started. Yay! <laughs> So if you don't know that this is our crew, you've met a few of them, but the show just wouldn't be complete without a couple of extra laughs. And so coming to us from the field is the very funny Fairy Kayla. Hey everybody, Fairy Kayla here. Happy Wooly Wednesday. <laughs> I hope you're having a great week so far. I just wanted to pop in really quick and share a wooly great joke with you. <laughs> Uh, so without further ado, um, what do sheep use to keep track of their wool? What, what do sheep use to keep track of their wool? Barcodes. Ah! <laughs> I've been holding 
about that one for a while. Thank That's you, probably Kayla. One of my Can I just see a big round of hearts for all the fairies? This is our crew. They pack your orders. They answer the phones. They answer your emails, and they keep us laughing all day long. Uh, and we so appreciate y'all being here, joining with us, and just having a little bit of a BFF hang around our craft of felting. And um, happy to spend this time with you today. So I'm going to bring in my little tray here of fibers. These are the fibers that we showed in the lead up to today's show. I'm going to do a quick run through and just tell you what's on my tray. And then um, as the gals mentioned, we're going to look at a variety of uh, projects that use these fibers um, and how they look when they're either needle felted or wet felted into a project and welcome your questions around that as well and we'll do our very best to give you good solid guidance towards your own felting um, creations or whatever you're trying to achieve so let's look here at what i have this little section right here is batting uh, let me just talk for real quick about batting if you will so batting is we're going to talk about fibers in a few different ways. So sorry to jump out of that. We're going to talk about fiber in a few different ways. When we talk about fiber, we often talk about its breed. We talk about its staple length or how long is that fiber when it comes off the sheep, when it's unstretched, how long is it? We might talk about its micron, which you heard the gals mention, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that, but that's either the coarseness or fineness. Think about it being the diameter of that those individual fibers. So the smaller the number, the finer the fiber, uh, the softer it'll probably feel next to your skin if it's wool. We'll also talk about the characteristics. Is the fiber crimpy, kinky, or is it more straight? And then we also like to talk about the way a fiber is processed. I know there's a lot of confusion around words like batting, roving, top, and sliver. And we do have a video that digs all into the wool and fiber. And that is, we have a complete video dedicated to that. This show is going to be a companion to that video and should help bring uh, just a few more ideas of applications of those fibers. But let me touch on it quickly uh, when we talk about these things. So anything that is batting may also be referred to as carded. Carded fibers are processed on a drum carter. So we've shared some little ones here on the show. Our fibers are made on these great big drum carters. Sometimes they're like almost 100 years old because these machines have been running for so long. But they're processed on a drum carter and they create what's called a web or like a great big bat. We tend to call it a bat. And a bat looks like this. This is our core wool batting. This is an example of a strip of batting, if you will. It's like a, this is a narrow strip of batting. Um, when we get them processed, they are enormous. They're really big bats um, that are like, as we make a big four pound, for example, and then cut them into individual pounds. But a bat is lofty, it's wide, and it's stacked. Bats made on different types of drum carters are different thicknesses, different consistencies. This consistency is very different from our merino short fiber bats or our bergschaft or maori bats. They're made in completely different facilities. But a bat is like a big lofty sheet. Roving is a slice of batting. People think roving and top or sliver are the same thing, but they're not. So this is an example of our core wool roving. And roving is also a carded fiber. Technically speaking, it's also a carded fiber. But the difference is that in the carding process, instead of coming off in one big sheet, the fiber is diverted usually off through some other part of machinery that brings it off in these long strips. And you might, may even have seen videos of people creating their own roving off their little mini drum carters, reeling it off in um, like a little disc where they pull it through a hole. So technically roving is a slice of batting and both roving and batting are carded fibers, technically. Now, I've confessed in other videos that a lot of people, and us included at times, will call other things roving as well because everyone comes looking for roving. 
Um, I didn't bring a thick example, but New Zealand Coriadel is uh, often called roving, but it's technically a sliver. So fibers, let's look at these fibers on my table just for a second. And these are batting, so they're gonna look similar to what I showed you. They're lofty. The fibers in batting and roving are going all different directions. They're all mixed up because what happens is the locks of the sheep, whatever breed they are, like this, are usually the locks from a sheep, and obviously these are dyed <laughs> or undyed, the locks from a sheep are put into like a hopper. They're all mixed up. Uh, they, they actually go through a picker, which will open up these fibers and loosen them. They'll go into a hopper, they get all mixed up, and then they run across the drum carter and reeled off in big wide sheets. And as a result, we're able to get these fibers that are mixed up, going multiple different directions, and even if you see somewhat of a grain, you see very little of a grain. Um, so they're all mixed up going in different directions. This is also true in roving because again, the roving is just a strip of the batting. When you have something that is a sliver or a top, those are the same things. Sliver or a top. This is a great example because it's got a bunch of colors running through it. This is a merino silk blend um, and our 80-20 blends have these really shockingly white strike of bombic silk through it. But this shows that the fibers are all going in the same direction. That's true with merino tops as well. Merino tops and New Zealand Coriadel. These are all referred to as a sliver or a top. They're the same thing. So what happens with a sliver or a top is all the fibers are aligned and going in the same direction. So you can see very clear striations in that fiber or direction in that fiber. Both of these types of fibers can be needle felted and both of these types of fibers can be wet felted. Depending on what you are needle felting or what you are wet felting will dictate how you handle the fiber in preparing it for being needle felted or for being wet felted. So before we look at any other fibers, I wanna pause right there and see what questions we have around that. We have a couple questions regarding the core wool. Uh, somebody is thinking that it's only for 3D. Is that true, Marie? Oh, absolutely, you can wet felt with the, the core wool. So like I've wet felted an entire cat cave with the core wool. Um, we had teachers, we've had teachers make um, big round wall hangings with children in swimming pools. So they like put the core wool in the bottom of a swimming pool and put all the decoration fibers on top and mesh over the top and then the kids like do a rug stomp. So you, you can also use it for the back of a wall hanging. We do sell a pre felt and I'll show you the pre-felts um, that are made from the fiber, but if you don't want to jump to a pre-felt, you can just wet felt the core wool. So it absolutely wet felts. Yes, what else? Um, just a lot of comments that that's already blowing their minds with oh, what good. they're learning. <laughs> good. Okay, so remember, it, it, roving doesn't mean much more than like towel in some way because people will just say can you needle felt with roving or people only needle felt with roving we will look at you know the way some of these things look different but roving just answers one question about a fiber and that is how is it processed so i'm going to back up a second and let's look at these fibers again just the wool fibers again um, and talk about what's different about them so let me get we're going to get in here so this is merino short fiber bats this is deliciously fine beautiful for next to the skin softness and it wet felts like a dream we have used the merino short fiber bats in a few wet felting projects, but one that may stick out in people's mind the most are our wet felting um, beads. So wet felting beads, we use it because it's very easy to make into little balls. It felts up very, very quickly. If I were felting with children and we've changed our wet felting of bookmarks kits to using merino short fiber bats. So if I were felting with children, I would use this, but I've used merino short fiber bats in vessels. I thought I had one here in vessels, in um, pictures, in all kinds of decorative items. They're just very beautiful to felt. We felted 3D items that end up getting stuffed. So if you want a very quick, foolproof, wet felting fiber, 
um, merino short fiber bats may be the answer. I wouldn't necessarily use it for a wearable because it tends to pill because these are very short fibers. So this is a 19.19 to 19.5 micron. It's very fine. It is beautiful for next to the skin, but may, may not be very hard wearing, but it will wet felt readily. Our MC1 batting is a 25 micron. This would be classified as a medium fiber. Not fine, not coarse. It's a medium fiber. It wet felts fabulously. We've wet felted vessels with it, purses with it, hats with it, slippers with it, and it needle felts great. You can needle felt stuff and then wet felt it, or you can wet felt something and then needle felt on top of it. And we've done all of that with our MC1 batting. This is all made from a USA sheep. The two, new, two newest fibers we've introduced to you are Bergschaff and Maori. Both of these are more coarse than MC1. Um, the Maori is next in line. Maori is 27 micron and the Bergschaff is uh, 33. It's interesting, you couldn't tell the difference if you were looking at them probably in person, but when you feel them, once your sensitivity is developed, you might be able to tell the difference. Both of these fibers are somewhat crimpy, but both of them are somewhat hairy. So the difference between MC1 is that besides them being slightly more coarse, they're going to have a little more hairy effect. It may not be your most preferred thing, but it might be just the color you're wanting for your project. That might be the reason to choose those for your particular project. So I would treat these the same. You can wet felt with them, you can needle felt with them, you can needle felt a picture and then wet felt it, you can wet felt a picture and then needle felt into it like a canvas. If you're looking to do something like that, check out our cluster houses video, which is from years ago, but we wet felted a canvas background out of MC1 and then we needle felted these cute little you know, clustered houses on there together. Fun, a fun project. So any questions on these before I jump forward? Yeah, Elise uh, mentions and asks, uh, she felted a little plant using a layer of merino sandwiched between maori. Merino she, top or merino short it's fiber? It's a 19 micron. Okay. Um, I wanted the stability of the coarser wool, but it turned out so hairy. Is there any way to avoid that hairiness? Well, it's a great question because hairy is a thing when you have these. So you're going to have these a little more hairy um, elements and they're going to want to poke through that fine merino. There's two things you can do. One is you can shave it with a fine razor, like a little disposable razor. And the other thing is you could burn off, if there's only wool fibers or natural fibers, you could burn off those like with a lighter and burn them off. But there's almost no way to tame this hairiness unless you just keep needle felting and needle felting and you can trim it with fine scissors. So trim with fine scissors, shave with a razor or burn it off with fire, like a little lighter, and it'll sit because it's just wool so it'll singe it down that can help you mm -hmm. along the line of coarse fibers and shaggy fibers are there some sheep that their wool is just not good for felting well you know it really depends on what you're felting like that's a great big question that's like saying is there some flour that's just not good for baking like really you might go well if you use this kind of flour you're gonna get this kind of result or you might need to make these adjustments so rather than talk about what doesn't work today, like here's what just doesn't work. I'm gonna share with you fibers that do work, that we carry here, they've all been tested, and we'll focus on getting results that you want versus results that you don't want. I hope that makes sense. Because there's a whole bunch of sheep out there. Let's focus on some ones that we can get our hands on, that come in some delicious colors, and we'll give you some really fun outcomes. And yeah. If you have a sample of something, just try it, you know? You, yeah, you never know what exactly. happens. Yeah, you, you'll, you never know what happens. And then you'll learn something about that fiber. Okay, so let's look at just a couple of other quick things just so I can get my tray out of the way and then we'll start bringing in samples to support the fibers that I brought today. So again, looking uh, here, um, this is where fibers start really right in the locks, in the locks phase and we talked about that. So different locks are gonna have different characteristics and then we're gonna process them into these different degrees. We have here, we have 16 micron merino top and 19.5 micron merino top. You'll find these in the shop. We have merino silk blends that might look a little more homogenous, like these guys. They're merino silk blends, but they're very subtle, um, beautifully blended striations of color. 
And then we have merino silk blends that are very bold, and I brought a couple of these today. Sorry, oh, over here. We have uh, merino silk blends that are very bold. The lines are very noticeable, and you can get great fun results with these, especially if you use the striations. Um, we did that in our cobweb scarves, which I'll share some with you. And then we're gonna look at some luster and luxury fibers and texture fibers. So I brought in some tussa silk, some bamboo, I brought in some viscose somewhere, and some wool nep. So all of these things can be used in your needle felting and wet felting. We'll look at how they appear. And then we have some pre-felts. So real quick, I want to look at these pre-felts with you. We have three types of pre-felts right now in the shop. So we have the courses. It's our PFX pre-felt, which we really like for wall hanging backs. Like uh, Anna Repke uses this on the back of uses this on the back of her wall hangings. It's thick, it's lofty, um, and we sell it in, I think, like four sizes. So it's a semi-coarse, around 26 microns. And then we have two 19 micron uh, products. If you were to feel them with me, they're very different, but they're both gonna perform beautifully together. This one is just our PFM pre-felt. They're both merino top. This one is a little more loose and lofty, and you could pick it apart. We actually, uh, felted half thickness in our paper thin uh, felt, which is a video that we did, I think it was earlier this year, how to make a paper thin felt fabric. And we use this, our PFM pre-felt, very soft and lovely, felts fast. And then this is our PFL, which we call our, our pre-felt light. And um, they are slightly different dimensions, but this is made with a longer fiber, whereas this is made with a short fiber. And this one you can't pick apart. It's almost translucent. They both will make beautiful um, backings for a pre-felt or something that you felt, and we'll look at those together too. So you can use these as inclusions in your surface design, and you can use them as a base underneath a picture or another project, if you will. Um, so this could be a base layer for something that's that's larger and felted. Okay, we good? Off to a good start? Yeah. Lots of, loading y'all with lots of stuff. So I wanna start just for, just for a moment with Merino Top. Merino top is something that if you asked me maybe 12 years ago, do you needle felt with merino top? I would have been one of the first people to say, no, don't felt with merino top. Use this, use that, use a batting, use something more coarse. And what I love about this genre is how many people around the globe are just pushing the envelope, pushing the envelope, and doing things that we never really thought of before. So you can wet felt with it. We often think of it as in uh, wearables. We think of it as, um, accessories, maybe purses and hats. Uh, here's a hat. I'm going to bring in a whole bunch of stuff that is wet felted. Uh, Jordan's got something for me. Okay, great. So we often think of it as in wearables. Where's my gloves? I have everything here for you. And we're going to I'm gonna make a big mess really fast because I'm pretty I'm pretty good at that. So we have a video, we have a free class on it's just on our YouTube right now. This never made it into the school, right, Jordan? This one? Not yet. Okay, this is like um, how to wet felt your own fingerless gloves. It's a really fun exercise to do. But one of the reasons we like to use merino top, especially 19 micron and finer, is it's really nice for next to the skin. We know about how much shrinkage to expect, 30 to 40% uh, you can get for a nice hard wearing, uh, like wearable, like a winter wearable, like a hat or a purse or uh, a wrist warmer or skirt, a dress or a coat. You could use merino top. Um, and you can also though use it for wonderful things like pictures. So it's very common for us to use them for wearables and wet felt with them, but this is an example of Blossom, which is a class that will be available in our school later in the year by Kimberly Pulley, and she used merino top in this piece. It's an absolutely gorgeous piece, and uh, merino top is a fiber that she used in the building of this piece. I brought another piece that I think really, for me, pushed the envelope about what I thought you could do with merino top. And this right here, this piece is our merino prefelt in the background. And this is uh, an Oprah that was done for us. You can see this if you visit our Instagram channel um, for the artist, um, Catherine, who did this for us. Absolutely amazing. And she TikToked the whole thing. This entire face is done with merino top. And she has 
needle felted it and wet felted it and needle felted it and wet felted it. And this to me really pushes the envelope of what can be done with merino top. Now I can't tell you how to do this. This is an artist, you know, made this happen and she did video the whole process on her TikTok and her Instagram. And you know what? I'll make sure we add that link after the show. It's on our Instagram. If you scroll down our Instagram, I have it. This one, um, if you want to learn how to do a portrait, make sure that you go to our school and register and take one of our free classes so you're sure that you can learn on that platform and you like learning on that platform. You can take a free class and you can learn how to do a portrait. This is of Kimberly's granddaughter. You could do your own granddaughter or some picture that you saw or even a self-portrait. Um, and this would be a really fun process. You're going to learn several techniques in there. So I wanted to share these with you as a little mind bender as far as what we can do with Merino top that really, I think, pushes through boundaries that over what we might have expected in the past. Another example, and people, a couple of people had asked about things that had been needle felted and wet felted, and people were saying, oh, if you wet felt it, then it gets squiggly or whatever. <laughs> this is a great example, um, and just one by Laura Ricks in our school, who um, is, teaches several classes, and this is called Breakwater Beach. Absolutely fantastic, and Laura both needle felts and wet felts with merino top and other luster fibers as well to create these incredible pieces. And student after student after student makes a picture that looks almost just like this. Like it's incredible. She's really broken down the class uh, into steps so that anyone can emulate her process to learn how to make their own breakwater beach. Just fantastic. So these are all examples of merino top that have been needle felted and wet felted. But what about if you're just needle felting with merino top? What if you just want to needle felt with it? Um, these I brought in a couple of tiny examples and oh, Jordan's gonna get us there. So we made this bird um, earlier this year. This is our, just our, one of our little Furby, <laughs> our little Furby guys. And then I'm gonna bring in some doll hair as well. So if you're just needle felting, there's still a place where you might bring in merino top or merino silk blends for applications where the fiber just stays pure to how it looks, you know, as you acquire it. So this fiber right here is a merino silk blend called Spice. This is what it looks like on its own. So you can see that in this doll's braids, we are using those striations for character. But this scarf right here, this is a cobweb scarf and we teach this free on our YouTube channel, uses those striations and takes advantage of them in the design to create this scarf. And if brown's not your color, well, those, those merino soot blends comes in lots of colors. This is the back of one scarf and this is the one not the one we did live, but I think the one we did in the 20 minute, in the 20 minute video. And here is it with a bunch of decadence fibers and ribbon, yarns and stuff like that in there. So this is wet felted, but I just wanted to show you it's the same type of fiber as in, used in this little doll's hair right here. Pause there. Um, do we have some questions or? A few things? questions. We okay. have something regarding the silk blends. Um, of course, can you need a felt with silk blends, which you pretty much already answered. But mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to keep the striations going the same direction, either in, mostly in wet felting, I believe they were mentioning cross hatching. Um, is that possible? There's a couple of things you can think about. So when we make our cobweb scarves, there's no, there's, we just lay them out straight. But what happens is although we lay them out straight, we will roll them, let's say this is the length of the scarf. So although we lay it out straight, um, because we will roll it also side to side, they do kind of start to just you know, meld with each other. They're very soft felted, as you can see. They're they're very drapey, but they're absolutely wearable. Like there's nothing, this, I'd have no problem in just shoving this in a bag if I'm traveling or I'll layer it over the side of my purse. It's absolutely felted. And we sort of break the rules of traditional layout with this scarf. It's one of the things I love about it. And also that you get such a fast result. So. Now, if you want something that's even thicker or more durable, you can lay down a base layer and let the striations of this be your top design layer. So you can always have a base layer of 
other merino or of a silk fabric or of a pre-felt and then just lay this on top and benefit from just getting those striations by laying it out in that one direction. And in that case, you also wouldn't shingle it. You would work with the length of the layers as they come on the top. Mm -hmm. nice. Good question. Oh, Vanderveer mentions that she loves using blends, or they, I'm not sure, loves using those blends to cover a short-haired animal. It gives such a nice texture uh, and variated kind of fur. That's fun, yeah, and my friend Joyce uh, used that fiber many years ago to make a sweet little wren. It was just adorable, so I love using that fiber. I think I think it comes across really well, so you can uh, needle felt with it, and, and we can look at it, too, in a little bit more of an application as well, um, and this is Merino Top. We did a little video is merino top um, over core wool and over MC1. The only thing you have to know when you use it for an animal fur or animal feathers is that there is a likelihood that if the piece is handled a lot, it's going to mat down if you use a fine fiber. So if you're worried about it being a child's toy or something that's gonna get handled a lot, then you can blend it with something like New Zealand Coriadale, which is more coarse. It's between like a 27 and a 33 micron, and the staple length is longer as well. Um, so there's just less Less chance of it matting together or felting just from being handled. It'll needle felt really well into a nice stiff felt, but again, this, the, it's so coarse and the staple length is so long, it tends to look kind of hairy. So you just kind of have to plan for that and what you want your final piece to look like. That answered Bonnie Roberts' question of which is best for to avoid uh, matting. <laughs> or if you're what? If you're doing what? I assume needle felting, but yeah. I'm not sure. There's always that question we have is what are you making? Because felting is is very is very non-specific in general. It's very non-specific. So I want to look at let's look at some of our um, let's jump to maybe some of our decorative fibers since we're kind of talking about merino top. I have a couple of little examples here that I'll put on the table you can look at and we can look at how some things look when they're uh, wet felted and we can look at how they're done when they're needle felted. So this is just a little slice if you will of our artful felt fabric. We've done a project like this a few times um, where we just make a blah of a color and just have fun with it and then put a lot of texture into it. So we have locks, we have neps, we have merino top on merino top, we have tuss of silk, we have yarn, uh, sari silk waist, pre-felt, um, more locks, Angelina, everyone always wants to know about Angelina, other scraps just from my studio. And this is all patchworked on top of pre-felt, on top of pre-felt. And this is our PFM pre-felt, but oh look, these backings here are the PFL pre-felt, so the light pre-felt, the PFM pre-felt, and silk gauze. All of these things can serve as a great base for a wet felting project, and I put them all together to show that although they are all different, um, the front of the piece here looks pretty much the same. You might get a little more shrinkage in one area than the other, but th what happens on the top has a lot to do with that as well. So this piece has silk fabric inclusion. It also has, in addition to everything else I've shown you, it also has some handmade pre-felt. And I know that someone asked about how do you make your own um, handmade pre-felt and we have a video on that on our YouTube channel but the quick way to get there is to go to our school feltingtutorials.com there's a free class on how to make your own pre-felt and that's a really fun process and uh, we also have one on how to make your own silky papers which is just great for inclusions and texture in your wet felted pieces so you can hand make your own pre-felt what's the difference between felting something with pre-felt or with merino top and I brought in this little hat I call September as an example so this hat is made with our 19.5 uh, micron merino top and the inclusions on top are this right here is um, this right here is pre-felt so notice this clean line it's a specific shape that I cut out and put onto the hat here's another one over here in white this right here is pre-felt. I was able to cut it out and put it right on top of the gray. And again, this is our PFM uh, pre-felt, white. Um, 
But then here, you can see how this line is a little more muted. This is just merino top, a silk piece of silk fabric in here. And then down here is like a silk hanky underneath the, the brim. So I just want to show you that, you know, you can bring these things together, but using a pre-felt can also be not just used as the base of something, but can also be used on top of something to get yourself nice, clean lines in your design, in your surface design. Questions on that before we jump forward? We have a couple of general pre-felt questions. Okay. Can you use pre-felt in Nuno felting? Yes, you can, but I think you should test the final application that you're going, you want the wearable piece to be. So if you want to make yourself a coat with this pre-felt and this design and idea, well, make yourself a purse first and carry it for three days. <laughs> and see how it wears and test how hard you've felted something um, and would you like one pre-felt over the other or you know do you want to felt it to 40 percent instead of just 30 percent so you might play with that um, as well so I have I didn't bring them with me but I do have uh, pre-felt samples where I've binded it with fabric, which is nano felt. For those of you who don't know, nano felt or nuno felt is when you bind a fabric with the fiber. And my, we have a complete samples class in this school as well, but my recommendation is to make a small samples. Did I bring, let me see. Just grab. This is what I do is I make a sample piece to see, do I like the result? Do I like the outcome? So let's just glance here. Like this is a great example of a using, you know, fabrics with fiber. And if you make yourself small samples, you can decide how you like it. This piece, I made a Nuno felt sample first. This is like a, I made a, a Nuno felt pre-felt first of this. It's just a yellow fabric that just melted into this yellow fiber and I wouldn't want to use those together in a large project because I feel like the yellow swallowed the yellow and there wasn't enough reason to even use the fabric because it just drowned in here. So my suggestion is to make whatever you're going to make, make yourself a small sample. We did a little texture sample like this a few years ago and then we made an eyeglass case. So we played with using the fabrics together and then later on we did something else. So this is silk fabric on the back, merino top in the middle, and more silk design work on top. So whatever you want to do or think you want to do, my recommendation is to make yourself a small sample first and rather than just say does this work when you know the fiber felt and you know the fabric will felt or if you do then you can ask yourself do I like how these elements come together do I like them and I keep little notes and we but you can at least take the high-level guidance from our course we have a fundamentals of wet felting course in the school where we make samples and I save these samples back and I mark on them what fiber did I use what uh, shrinkage did I get? And then I always have a touch sample of like how something feels. So for example, this is, um, this is our PFL pre-felt, uh, very light and lovely. This is our PFM, no, this is Merino short fiber. And I even write on here the weights that I felted so that I can think about how that thickness comes together. This is one of my favorites, it's the Yak. And while it might be like just a tad hairy, I still am waiting for the day where I allow myself time to make myself a hat from it because it's so soft, so, so, so soft. So I encourage you to make little tiny samples. Shauna LaRosa says, oh, uh, OMG, I love these. They would make a great patchwork bag. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, if you sew them all together, for sure. You have to do, I think you almost have to do a quilt as you go because you don't want to have all those folds, all those folds in the fabric. Now, someone asked earlier about, if nano felting, just while we're on that topic, what fibers to use with silk gauze. My recommendation would be to go with merino top. I would go with merino top um, just because it's a little bit easier for the fibers to migrate through. I'm very dedicated to us uh, nano felting a scarf together this year. I really want to make that happen for you so that we can make something. But if you just want to jump on something, we have this fun little video on making these little neck warmers. And then we have a bigger PDF where I make like whole shawls. I think I brought a big one. But these little neck warmers are kind of a fun little project. 
I know it's not the season for it. We're having our hottest May on record right now. <laughs> but you can play with different textures and fibers, and this is a free video, and then there's also a PDF on our website that you can um, get that takes you through this was like a little model and then I made a big model and I also did a black and white one and I did one that I called Galapagos but what's fun about that is you can play with different types of fibers and see what kind of effect you're getting and on the back of this and you can't see it all that well but let's look at it if you can in between here is a whole piece of silk gauze and this whole scarf is built on top of the gauze but you only see it running up the middle and then all of these fibers are put on top, fibers and fabrics and yarns um, are put on top for like some extreme texture, including locks just sticking off the end here. So it's a fun little project to do if you just want to check it out. And, and if you don't want to wear it, it can always be a little table accent or something like that. Mm -hmm. Nice. Cool. While we're on the topic of Nuno felting and silks, uh, Patty asks, what silk type gets you the most wrinkles when Nuno felting? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when, when we're Nuno felting, um, we like to combine, the, the, originally, you know, Nuno felting was discovered by Polly Sterling and her studio partner or assistant, and they wanted to design a lightweight felt that was very wearable in hot climates. Traditionally, and when I started felting, it was always like, you need three layers, and we did thick layers, and it was different, it was stiff. We were always making a stiff felt. They wanted to make a lightweight and drapey felt, so they decided to bind the fiber with fabric, and different fabrics perform different ways. Did I bring, okay. Um, so you're going to get different results. Another great reason to make samples and also to learn. So let me just remind everyone, when you're with Nuno felting, you want to slow down the felting process. Therefore, we use cooler water or room temperature water um, because you want to give the fibers time to migrate through the fabric. If you rush it, if you're too aggressive or the water's too hot, it's more likely that the fiber will felt to itself and the fabric will not stick. The fibers will not have time to migrate through. It's the other reason I wouldn't use merino short fiber bats in Nuno felting because they felt like that and you want to slow it down a little bit and give those fibers time to travel through. So looking here, this uh, big, sh oh, let me show it to you big first. So this is some big obnoxious shawl that I call <laughs> Galapagos uh, and I don't know why I just had to make it but it's, it's huge and it doesn't go with what I'm wearing at all, um, but you can see it has lots of colors and lots of textures in it. And the puckeriest thing on here is the habitat. So let's look at that. Can you see all of these puckers in the habitat? So this uh, right here is all the pucker. You get that because of the fiber, I have a bunch of empty, space there. Oh, uh, we have, uh, you get that from the fiber on the back. So it's the fiber on the back is grabbing onto the fabric on the front, but it doesn't migrate through as readily because this is a denser, this is probably an eight mommy. So when we talk about silk fabric, we have another measurement and it's abbreviated with an MM and some people will say mummy and some people will say mommy and momia and I don't really care if you say pecan pecan or whatever <laughs> I don't care um, but that is a measurement of a silk's density to be very specific if you had a hundred yards of fabric that's 45 inches wide something that's 3.5 would weigh 3.5 pounds so if it's 3.5 mommy that 100 yards, 45 inches, would weigh 3.5 pounds. This, I believe, is an eight that I used, so that would weigh eight pounds. So it's much heavier than gauze, therefore the fibers, the fibers are even different. If they feel different, you know, but they're also closer together, it's more dense. So it's more resistant to receiving the fiber, therefore you get the pucker in this case. So let's look at gauze. Let's see if I have some gauze on the back. Real okay. quick, Marie, what was yeah. the fiber that you used on the back of the habitat? Just merino top. It's all just merino top. Mm -hmm. awesome. Okay, and then on the back here, this is, this is just gauze, so 3.5 or 5 maybe even gauze. It doesn't pucker as much or the same way. The fiber will integrate with it readily. But then if you play with something like our... Um, this is our Uzbek silk, and right now we have our rarefied. Now this is hand dyed, so hence all the, the variegation in color, but you can intentionally get wrinkles as well. And one of the things I love about this Margolon silk um, is 
just how much sheen it has. Um, it's also very, very delicate. So in this, the Rarified, you don't want to wear it by itself. You want to have fiber on it, but you get some great texture from it. It's really fun. And all of this texture, basically, I put in there by gathering it up, except for just the little bubbles. That happens all by itself. So it's really fun. And again, you can also make yourself just some little samples, or you can make yourself a, a neck warmer that has a bunch of variety, or a big wrap that has a bunch of variety, or a table runner, or wall hanging, whatever, and just see how you like your fabrics and your fibers combining. So, nice. fun to play with. Kind of follow up to the, what we've learned about Nuno felting, is it a good idea to Nuno felt with a sander, or a bad idea? I, you know, it's really going to come down to personal preference. Some people just felt with a sander and some people felt by hand. Um, you're going to get different results when you felt with a sander, which is just going to be compression and vibration than when you roll things. So everybody felt differently. My recommendation would be just to test it out for yourself if you want to and see how you feel about it. Because I have people who never felt with a sander and they felt incredible wearables. And I have other people who only felt with a sander and they do a great job too. So I think it's really going to come down to personal preference. I think Kami Wogu uh Nuno Feltz and uses something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, like I did a, I did a, a group a retreat with Charity, and I'll actually I'll bring in Charity's dress. And there, some people were using Sanders just to speed up the work. Speed so up. yeah, it's up to you. So I'll, I'll bring this in as we segue into more of like the decadence fibers. Um, this dress here, you, you can't see the whole thing. I'll, I'll put her up for a second. So I'll, I'll hold her up so you can kind of see <laughs> this. This dress is called um, the Sunset Dress. It's by my friend Charity Vandermeer. Um, absolutely gorgeous dress, and this is in our school. And look, you can make it in any colors you want. She teaches you how to make a fitted dress for your body very easily, and this this big collar is optional. Um, but it's a wonderful it's a wonderful process, and um, this dress inspired this uh, vessel. So here's, you see this. This uh, dress inspired this vessel that I call the um, Simply Striking Fire Bowl. So if you're just getting started, hold this mover. If you're just getting started wet felting, you can play with something as small as this. It's a little one ounce wonder, just one ounce of merino top and viscose on top, and you get this gorgeous um, texture and color and sheen. And what I love about this, just comparing these two, and we'll probably just look one more closely one more time, uh, is this one here is an example of what if you nano felt with this. So you get even more texture and more pucker than here. This is just the uh, viscose laying on top of wool. And this one is um, sandwiched in silk fabric. So this is a 16 micron wool. There is silk fabric on top of it and then the viscose on top of that and that's how you get all this gorgeous texture. And Charity shows you exactly how to make this dress in the course. So lots of fun you can have with um, luster fibers and luxury fibers and wet felting but you know you can play with them in your needle felting too and that's something that you may not think of traditionally so I brought in just a couple of examples for you to look at and then I promised some things I want to make sure that we get to so this is an example here. Here's a couple of examples. So this little bug, some of you might have met her before. Her name is Jasmine. My friend Amy Long made her for me. She teaches a fun class in the school called Bug Buddies. And in bug, this is one of her um, bug buddies that she shows how to make in the school. A great fun class and you can learn to make your own bug, whatever you want him to look like. But this, this bug is just a gas. And she made me this one here. I basically gave her my color palette, my favorite fibers and she made this little muse she's my creative muse her name is Jasmine and um, Jasmine's wings are felted where am I Jasmine's wings are felted with a lot of these textures the sari silk waist maybe some silk hankies and stuff that we like uh, to use in wet felting and these are wet felted but recently we've used some of these decadent fibers in our mushroom projects so like this was a 2d mushroom project we did a couple of years ago and this was is like our little 3d magnet or uh, brooch 
um, mushrooms that we did together. And this is sari silk waist and hankies and locks and just all kinds of stuff blended in here. Lots of fun to have. And you can also use them for hair. Uh, this is viscose or gnome beards. Um, this little dolly, this little dolly's hair is just pure viscose. And we show a couple of videos where we, this is Ginger Beard, he is a kit, um, so you can make him also. So there are ways that you can use these decadence fibers in your needle felting projects too. You're just going to have to modify your approach a little bit because it's not going to felt like wool. You need something for it to grab onto and tangle up with a little bit. And in some cases, it's just gonna be a straight, delicate application. And in other cases, it's gonna be, you know, really pounded into fiber or something and really kind of matted together. So technically these fibers don't felt, but you can anchor them into either a fabric or a fiber base beneath and get some really interesting and fun results. Kevin asks if you can kind of card or blend those fibers into MC1 or Merino, anything else, um, or would you just kind of apply it? You can, you, you can try. So something like Sari Silk Waste is really a matted mess. So if you go to card it, it's just going to, your teeth, the teeth of either your hand cards or the drum cards are going to kind of tangle up. But viscose, locks, naps, bamboo top, tessa silk top, all of these things we absolutely card into bats. They'll card into longer fibers or fibers processed into a sliver uh, more readily than in the batting, but we've done it. That's uh, what we used to do with our, um, we used to make a, a special bat for Halloween and now there's too many of you and only one of me. So we, <laughs> we, don't, we haven't been doing that any anymore. So um, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's possible, but play with it, you know, in little small increments, if you will. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, what else? Anything specific? Uh, a lot of specific things, but I'm trying to keep them on topic. Um, uh -huh. not, not yet. We'll, we'll okay, let's, let's come out maybe just a pinch here. Okay, so I brought just a little something with, with me because some of y'all have asked about doing fine lines or how these things felt differently. So I started just a little play project and we won't have time to go very far, but we will zoom in and look at this a little, a little more closely. And I started just doing a big um, paisley. I have a friend who really loves paisleys and I thought that might be a fun way to play with some different fibers. So as an example, this fine line here is just our MC1 batting um, drawn into a fine line. And I don't know if you can see this fine line right here, but this is a merino silk blend. So I'll start with like the most obvious. The most obvious in doing like a straight line in your needle felting is that you choose a long straight fiber. And yeah, you can absolutely do that. We used to always say, you know, don't needle felt with merino top. And usually it's because it's a little hard for the needle to grab onto. But look, the world has changed. So if you see an old video of me saying that, just <laughs> ignore her, <laughs> ignore her completely. But this is an example of doing a fine line with a nice straight fiber. So you can just pull off a length. It doesn't have to be longer than you need, but you might find it helpful. And then if I have an end here that's a little loose and a little wiry, well, what you can do is kind of go backwards and anchor down the loose ends and then come to the edge where you want to be here. We're just gonna trim this little pink part and then we're gonna go backwards. So I'm using a very fine needle. This is my 42 triangle needle. And we would say draft out the fiber. Drafting is a term that would be used by a spinner. Spinners draft out, which means that the fibers are very close together. When they draft, they're just gonna pull the fibers slightly apart. So if it's too thick, you can just draft the fibers and you're pulling by holding them in one place and pulling a little bit. Then you're just slightly loosening those fibers a little bit and getting them a little further apart so that you can get a little thicker of a line. So going from here to here, that's drafting. So then you're just gonna guide it as you go with your needle to get that fine line. And if you're not grabbing onto it with your 42, for some reason, you're not quite grabbing onto it, well then try your 40. But I would go gentle at first because a coarser needle on a fine fiber, um, either you're gonna find that it slips and it doesn't really wanna grab, or maybe it pokes it too far. And so maybe you, if you use a slightly coarser needle, 
and a 40 triangle is a fine needle, but just tack it in place to get it where you want it and then go back with your 42 triangle needle and get it into place. So this is a wool uh, silk blend that I'm needle felting in here right now and it's a little bit easier to grab onto. Um, okay, so this is a fine line with the, a merino top or a New Zealand, if you had Sliver, uh, New Zealand Coriadale, you're just gonna use the same approach. Now to get rid of this end here, you can fold it back, uh, back on, or if that's too thick, you can just cut it and needle felt that edge down, if you can't pull it off, if it's too long to pull off. And again, the staple length um, is gonna dictate whether you can pull something off or not, so you could just cut it. So that's one way to get a fine line. If you have a batting, this is the MC1 batting, um, it's not hairy, needle can be needle felted very smooth, but if I want to do a long line with the MC1, like I did all of this, well I'm just going to take a length, whatever length I can get a hold of, let's say, I'm going to draft it out very much like we did, just maybe pull it to a little bit thinner, and then I'm just going to start somewhere. In this case, I am going to use my fine needle. I'm going to start right here on this end and again you're just doing the same thing you're just tacking it down and pulling it and tacking it down and pulling it and you can always go back over and layer an area or cover up what you just did okay let's see what questions do we have right now while we're doing this just fine sure. lines um, let's see just general or questions. needle felting yeah um, let's see is it acceptable to use non wool as a background for a landscape or a or a 2d image you know, I think that's just going to come down to preference. It's like some people will only use a cotton batting in their quilt and some people will use an acrylic batting in their quilt and that's going to come down to how they want it to shrink. And if you use a non-wool product, like meaning a different type of felt, an acrylic felt, I think you should experiment with it because what we've seen and we've tested a lot of different uh, felt backgrounds is that some cannot take the density of the wool that you want to put into it and they readily pucker. And so ask yourself, do you like the results of what you're getting with that fabric? Look, if you're felting with kids and you're in a K through 12 environment, you're going to go with the cheapest stuff you can get to get the job done. You know what I mean? We, we do art on paper plates, <laughs> you know, with the kids. If you want to sell a piece, you know, if you want to sell a piece, uh, you're going to want to choose the best fibers and fabrics to support the end result. And I'm going to say, just go with the end result that you get. I do use wool felt. I find that it holds up better um, to, to the density of the product and it doesn't pucker. Okay, what you can see here in this piece, this is MC1 batting up here. It's very smooth. It's very easy to needle felt and get smooth. This product right here is the Maori. The Bergschaft is going to look very similar. And this is going to require a little more time to go back over and get everything really laid down because it's a little more hairy. So tack, tack, tack it down. If it's too hairy for your taste, go over it with the fine scissors. This is the Merino Short Fiber Bat. The thing I want to point out at this is you can see how loose it still is and you can see the needle marks. Um, this, this merino short fiber bat actually takes a little more effort to get it all to felt and I think it's because the fibers are so fine and even my finest needle has to really make a lot of work to grab onto those fine fibers. So I'm always able to tack it down kind of quickly, but you're going to want to use maybe your cluster needle, so a cluster of the 42s and we cover all the needles last week. So go watch that video and we also have one on our felting needles page and you're gonna to wanna to really go after this and tack it all down. Now some people ask about the reverse needle and what I did with this little piece is I tucked I'm gonna just peel this back so you can see how little is actually sticking to my wow pad even though I've been needle felting on here I tucked a little piece of this blue Bergschaft behind my yellow dot I'm just gonna oh I got my reverse needle wasn't thinking put my reverse needle in there. I put a little blue behind my yellow dot and I want to pull some blue up through the bottom and I wanted I did this because I want to make some irregular polka dots and we'll look at this together I need to grab my scissors here I wanted to make some irregular polka dots that weren't so intentionally placed right on my dot I wanted them to be a little more free-spirited and then I'm going to trim them a reverse needle pulls wool out 
So Jordan, feed me something while I grab my scissors. Is there a specific fiber that works best for reverse needles when getting a furry look? Or do all of them kind of interact will, the same? Yeah, no, it will help you to have something a little bit longer because, I, and I'll show you this done on a short piece as well. So like, imagine, I'm gonna trim this all the way down so you can see what it looks like. Imagine you did this um, for uh, speckles on a dog's muzzle. Imagine if you put uh, if you put black or gray, a really dark gray underneath the dog's muzzle, um, and you wanted just to get these little tiny specks or spots, then you could put that underneath. Now in this case, notice that I'm I'm cutting it flush. I don't want it to be hairy and sticking up. I want it to be just down like that. So it really depends on what your outcome is. I wanted some mixed spots. If you want a little longer staple length, you could still just trim it less. So what's under there is bergshaft. It's kind of kinky. You could speckle or you know fur out a critter like on the top of the head and then cut it so that it's not completely flush. Now, I brought my little kangaroo buddy here, this guy, this kangaroo buddy, and now him, he's just been this thing that's kind of morphed over the years. Originally, I started making him, and um, I got a little discouraged because some people pointed out how his ears are wrong. <laughs> I know my Joey. <laughs> I had fun making him though. Uh, but uh, Joey is just just something that I started making for fun. And then I don't know if we did it on video, but I started adding this fur onto him. All this fur is topically added and trimmed, which we've shown in a few videos and I'll grab something to share with you. But right here, his tummy is all MC1 batting. And I used a reverse needle. What did I just do with that? Oh, it's right here. I used a reverse needle on his tummy. So this is a short fiber and you might not think about using it uh, with the reverse needle but I needle felted him well and then I just fluffed out his tummy a bit so just by pulling that out and then you can still trim it off if you want I think I used a more a more gentle needle just know that pulling that needle out is going to unfelt your piece uh, it's going to unfelt your piece a little bit. So keep that in mind. You want to felt something pretty dense before you go pulling fiber out. And what you put underneath, you know, you could even cut a fiber, cut a shorter fiber and put it underneath. But if I want something to be furry, I want to put it from, for me, I, I want to be like to have a dedicated hair or fur. I want to put it on the outside. And, um, we have a couple of videos, uh, one we called, we did, we made some fur bits, and one we showed you how to make this little tiny, um, we showed you how to make this little tiny sample here, and this sample was how to make something with a fluffy fur, and this is hand blended, you know, fur to get a particular coat, and how to make something a little more hairy and these are both topical applications so think about what you want if you just want a little flump you know coming out of here if you just want a little you know fuzz here if you just want a little fuzz on the tummy well then yeah consider using your reverse needle like if you just want to fur up this face a little bit well then you might consider you, you know using your reverse needle Let me pull this off to, to get that out of there and just get it a, a little furry. But if you want it to look hairy, then consider this. So this is a tutorial, we called it our furbit tutorial. And then later we applied it to making like a little bunny pillow. And this is my little working model. So we did a little 2D bunny and then we applied that same fur technique on top. So I thought I had something else here, but that's, that's something to consider um, is what do you really want that fur to look like? How much control do you want to have over that fur when you use a reverse needle? So for the reverse needle, you can reverse a batting but also keep in mind not to go too deep if you have core wool underneath. So think about what's under underneath. And I, I hope that helps. Play, make your, test, test little pieces like this. Make, we call these fur bits, which we ended up naming our fur comb the fur bit. But um, make little fur bits and test your ideas before you get to that full animal. You know, build your whole animal in the core wool if you want, but then test your fur and furring and reverse needle ideas on little fur bits and save these back. So you remember, you might use these to, to achieve specific coat blends as well as different hair and fiber 
you know, blends. Mm -hmm. Marilyn says she doesn't see anything wrong with his ears. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. I've never held a Joey. Maybe one day I'll, I'll get to. Um, any other questions or things we can address? And was today helpful? I, oh my goodness. So many people have said they're going to bookmark this. Some people would like a guide or something like that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay, so we're working on a guide and we, we haven't finished it that kind of cover the fiber. So give us a week or two. Make sure you get on our newsletter. So just go to our email, our, our webpage on the very bottom. You can get our fun newsletter. As soon as we finish it, like I want it to be just right, you can do that. And I'd like to put out for you that we'd like to really welcome you to submit Submit to us, um, and how shall we do that? Should we do it via the the contact us page or comments down below? I really I want something more solid. So more than a comment, you can use the contact us page. So we'd like to do another fur challenge. It's been a few years since we've done specific coats, um, and where we've done videos where you submit photos of animals and you want to know how to achieve their coat. But we need to know: Are you doing a 2D picture or are you doing a 3D sculpture? And we need really good quality pictures of the animal that you're doing. And we'll do some fur blends and show you how to achieve them. So just like this little bunny which matches a bunny I saw at my sister's house um, and we've, we've done a variety of animals as well now if you just want some quick animal stuff check out our alpaca we have um, I think camel and yak in the shop as well alpaca camel and yak so that we have some natural fibers available under other fibers but if you want to achieve some specific coats send us a picture Tell us what you're needle felting or wet felting and what you want help with. And then maybe we'll look at doing another fur blending show to help you achieve what you're trying to achieve. Good. Oh, yes. Okay. So just one more thing I want to share with you. Now, I've mentioned a few times our school, feltingtutorials.com. We still have a sale going on. In fact, I was just talking to Jordan as of right now, we're going to extend the sale and... Um, we have some of you who are already signing up and already the kits are starting to go out this week. Don Edwards wet felting a woodsy vessel class, a great way to experiment with felting a slightly stiffer fiber, uh, wet felting with batting, wet felting over a resist, creating some amazing textures and working with a variety of the fibers that we've shared with you today. This is a fun class. Me and the staff took it in person. You were here, where's Jordan? I was. Yeah, and we, we all made one together. It was a great collaboration and um, I got to see this one being made as well. It's called Wet Felting a Woodsy Vessel with Don Edwards. The class is on sale um, through the 13th. The class through the 13th, the class starts the 13th, sales on through the 22nd. You can get a kit for it right now. I think they're the same price, so the kit's on sale too. Um, so check it out. Wet Felting a Woodsy Vessel with Don Edwards. Great class for the beginner intermediate um, person as well. Um, so listen, next week we have a fun felting project to do with you. I hope we get everything all done. Then we'll be felting a little project together. If you're looking for something fun to do or a toe in the water project, we have tons, tons, tons on our um, YouTube page. You can also visit the learn page of our website just to drop some ideas. You might check out our staycation series where we did some uh, travel postcards at the beginning of the pandemic when none of us could go anywhere. <laughs> so we went to Santorini. I have friends in Greece. I was very inspired by them. We went to Provence, France, uh, and we also visited Hobbiton. So I think that's another one that we did together. So you might consider a little picture and that's just a little bit of a teaser for some more fun to come. But that's not all. We're going to give away prizes right now. Jordan's been taking names for all your fantastic questions. And just before we go, I want to say I brought in a little fuzzy guy remember him if you have the fuzzies in your project consider a less fuzzy fiber if it's too little and too fuzzy this guy is felted with roving he's super fuzzy uh and picked him up at a show and we, he's our little fuzzy mascot so if you're having trouble with fuzzies try the merino the um mc1 try the bergshaft try the maori if those are still too fuzzy then needle fault them all the way and give them a trim yeah, I didn't save say you that. some sanity. Yeah, I didn't say that. okay. We're gonna draw some names. I'm done talking. Okay. Uh, me first. Okay. There we go. You first. You next. Oh, me next. Thank you all for participating with us. So we're gonna give away some prizes. So for today, we are going to give away. Hmm. How about we give away a wow pad bundle like last time? We'll mm -hmm. give away either a wow pad bundle or a, a sampling of felting needles. And I have Karen Bouglas. 
And I have Lynette Romer. Congratulations, y'all. And thank you everyone for participating. If we didn't answer your question, if we didn't call your name, leave a comment down below and tell us. And remember the fur challenge. You can use the contact us page on our website. Send us a picture. And whether you're 2D felting or needle felting, needle felting, yeah, 2D or 3D, how we can help. All right. Awesome. That's Thank it. you, guys. Thanks, y'all. Have a great day. Bye.